you know, we've been looking at, uh, I love my church. It's kind of our theme so far. If you notice what's coming up in February, people that you, you uh, should hang with and people that you shouldn't hang with, we're just kind of carrying this theme right along. And uh, go ahead and let you know, Pastor Delbert's not hooking church, okay? He's preaching. He's just preaching at another church. He got a call a couple of weeks ago from a, another pastor that had saw our, uh, our web page and looked at some things on the internet, saw where we have our television broadcast and just observed that. And so he called uh, Pastor Delbert and he asked him to come over to his church this Sunday and bring the word of the kingdom of God. Because they are experiencing a movement of the kingdom. Their, their belief system as far as the kingdom of God and the present reality and the way God works is, is in line with what Pastor Delbert teaches and what we teach here at LifeGate. So that's where they are. He and Miss Judy are not skipping church. They're over to another church, bringing our ministry, so to speak, representing us. Amen? Representing God, of course, but also representing us. You see, we, we take the folks a lot of times away from church and what church represents, and yet we represent this church to our community, right? So, uh, so as we go into the community, we're taking LifeGate Church into the community. All right. So I ask you a question. Do you love your church? Well, then why don't you come to church? Very simple question. <laughs> right? I mean, it sounds simple. Well, I love my church. Really? Well, then why don't you come to church? Well, I'm sick. Okay. You want to get healed? Sure. Why don't you come to church? That's simple, right? Okay. How about salvation? What's stopping you from experiencing things of God's? And we'll examine one reason. It's kind of a passionate reason for me, okay? Because I like to think of myself as, as uh, really not ever really wanting to miss church. I think last year I went on maybe two vacations and then we had a group uh, outing. But we talked about it the other night when I was developing, you know, what I was wanting to share. Even when we're away from the church, we're still with the church. Because when we're there, we're talking about being here. And what we're missing. And even on Sunday mornings, most of the time we're together praying. We usually gather somewhere in, in the condo or in a, in a cabin, wherever we're staying for our vacation. And we'll start praying Sunday morning. Somewhere around the time before service starts or when service is beginning, we start praying for our church. For the people here, for the leadership here. So even when we're away from church, we're still at church. And we do that on purpose. We make it a purpose and an intention for us to do that on Sunday. Even when we say we're on vacation, that, that part of Sunday morning we set aside usually to either discuss what's going on at church, pray for what's going on at church. Sometimes we'll just get into our own little church thing going, you know, uh, discussing the Word of God, preaching back and forth to each other, uh, singing the songs, discussing the songs. We never let it go. It's something that's instilled within us. And so... Out of that, I got to thinking, okay, how do we approach church? Why do you come to church? You know, what's, what's the reason? How, how do you look at church? Well, think about it this way. What if church were, was like where you worked? Okay, most of us work. Some of us don't have to. Some of us can't, which is fine. That's not a problem. But most of us know what it's like or have experienced in some way, shape, or form a job or having a job. Okay? So let's say you're, you're hourly. You get paid by the hour. And you're supposed to work a 40-hour week. Okay, tomorrow you decide, well, I'm not going to work. And so you just don't show up. What do you think your boss is going to do? Fire you? You Suspend you? You think you're going to pay you? Right? Unless you have sick leave and you can fake it very well. So my purpose is that, or, or what I'm saying is you intentionally lay out of work... You don't expect them to pay you, do you? Okay? Well, there are 52 Sundays in the year, right? Provided the government doesn't add one or two more in there. They've been known to do that here lately, is add things in. 52 Sundays. You have 52 opportunities, at a minimum, 52 opportunities to come to church and be blessed by God. Right? 52 chances. 365 days out of the year. And you know you've got at least 52 opportunities to come and experience God. Do you take advantage of it? You know, I'm really preaching to people who aren't here. Isn't that funny? (laughs) But they'll get the message. Maybe we're here today because we thought, you know, I really do need to go to church. It's been like, it's a funny expression, it's been a month of Sundays since I've been to church. 
A month of Sundays is every Sunday. Okay? So you haven't been to church in the whole month. So you decide to go. So maybe that's you. You know, uh, could be me. Could be that I haven't been to church. Because you see, a lot of times you can come to church and not be at church. Come to church and be somewhere else. Let you in on a little secret. Sometimes the pastors don't feel like coming to church. We wake up just like everybody else does on a Sunday and go, because see, life sometimes can take its toll on you, even when you're pastoring, even when you're ministering. But thank God He gives us the strength to want to come. Amen? What would it be like if Pastor Delbert said, you know what, I'm just not going to go Sunday. And he didn't show up. Of course, somebody would get up here and substitute for him, but it wouldn't be the same, right? So, if you don't go to work, you don't get paid, right? So you've got 52 opportunities to get blessed. What if God said, you know what, you got 52 Sundays. You showed up 25 of those out of last year. So I'm going to dock you 25 blessings for this year. How would that make you feel? If God looked down and said, uh, you still, you know, you had 27 blessings uh, that you had this year, but you could have had 52. So, if my math is right. Man. So... You don't show up, He docks you 25 blessings. What if out of that 25 blessings, that's the one that would change your life? Forever. And you didn't take advantage of that opportunity. You didn't show up to receive what God had to offer. You didn't present yourself. See, we don't think of it that way. We think, well, God will forgive me. And He absolutely, 100% will. But I'm not talking about the way He thinks and does. I'm talking about the way we think and approach God. Amen? Um, one of the things I got to looking at is why people don't come to church is probably and more likely rooted in why they came to church in the first place. Does that make sense to you? you know, that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? People don't come to church because of the first reason they came to church. And here's why. Why did you first start coming to church? Well, I can answer that for me. We were in crisis. Big crisis. We had people, you know, now that come and say, Oh, boy, we wish we had your marriage. We wish we had your kids. You don't know what you're asking for. I promise you, you don't. Well, your, your marriage is so good, y'all never argue. <laughs> okay? Yeah. No, we don't argue in front of y'all. And really, we don't. Because we've learned some things in the Scriptures, not to let the sun go down on our anger. not to, you know, And I approach my wife the way Christ approaches the church. She approaches me the way that God wants us to approach Him. Amen? See what I'm saying? So we've learned some things over the years. It took 20 years to get there, but we've learned it over the years. And it's hard work. So one of the reasons that we first started coming to church is because our, our family was hurting. We were in bad shape. We had a crisis in our church. Our family, our marriage relationship wasn't all that, that hot. I was gone all the time. Didn't have time to spend time with the kids. And for those of you who don't know, you know, I am a musician. So what I was doing is I was playing semi-pro music, traveling around with a band, had joined the Country Music Association, all that stuff. And you think, my goodness, I had it going on. You remember the CMAs? I had uh, an album going. We had cut maybe four songs off of the album. It was being produced by, by one of the uh, big guys in Nashville. We were hanging out with all the people in Nashville. Had this great music career opportunity going. And I walked off and left every bit of it behind. I said, I've had enough of that. I need my family. And I need God. And I turned and I walked off and I left it. But you see, God rewarded me with something else. He gave me a strong family and it took a lot of work. And that's the reason I started coming to church. That's why that's my focus in God is family. That's why we're almost like the mafia when it comes to family. We, we, we can do things with each other, but you best not mess with our family. Okay? Because we're tight. And we purposefully do that. We won't let we don't won't let each other talk about each other in our family. We will stop you and correct you immediately. You do not talk about members of our family if you are family or if you're not. So that's why I started coming. So I've stuck with it. We've stuck with it. Our kids had no choice. Sunday morning they're going to church. It wasn't I don't feel like it. Sorry, you're going to church. Well, I don't like going there. Sorry, you're still going to church. And that's why, you know, you say, well, he's just stick the musicians up there because they're his kids. They don't have a choice. I gave them no choice. And what they did is they developed that heart 
for God. You know, we're still in contact with our oldest who's away from church right now. He's, I say away, he's away from this church, and so not away from church. But he's still, every day, pray for me. I'm praying for y'all. Uh, God's doing this. I want a wife that's going to be godly doing that. And he, and he sat down, or he's going to sit down with, with, with all the people around him and let them know this is what I expect because I operate this way in God. We did it purposefully. We came here and presented ourselves as a living sacrifice so that God could change our lives. I mean, isn't that why you come to church? See, Jesus had a, had a uh, ministry, and He would travel around and He would heal folks. He would, do, uh, you know, he would preach the Word of God. He would say, you've heard that this is what God's like, what the kingdom's like, but here's what I'm going to tell you that it's like. And He would use a lot of stories that would give us an idea. We could compare those stories to something that we're familiar with, and we would understand what He's saying, right? So, I got to thinking about that. What, how would he approach it today? How would you know, Jesus approach it? He'd probably go out in the community and heal the people that are sick and perform the miracles. He'd probably do all that. But you know, it's been 2,000 years since his ministry's been established. And he handed that mantle off to a group of people that we call the church. He handed off his anointing to the people we call the church. That's us. And he said, the things that you've seen me do... You'll do greater things than that. I will empower you to do twice as much, or ten times, or a thousand times as much as I did. But are we doing it? Are we changing things? You can't if you don't come to church. Well, I can do things away from the church. Oh, really? Well, what if Jesus were here? What if He actually showed up physically? Wouldn't you want to be here? What if He was in the lobby? Out there. Would you sit in that chair? Would you stay in that chair if you knew Jesus was standing right out there in that lobby? Or would you get up out of the chair and go out there? Oh, well, he'll come in here in a minute. I don't have to go find him. He can find me. And isn't that kind of the approach? You know, especially to those who have come to church for a little while, and then you go away and you quit coming, you quit coming, you quit coming, and you wonder why things get back so bad. Well, Jesus got to come and find me. Uh uh. He's, he's already ministered to you. You've got to go back to Him. So can, you, can, can I substantiate that? Absolutely. Matthew chapter uh, 9 says something like this. This is the way Jesus approached things. Went out into, and ministered to the community. Came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in this house. Now let me, let me set this up a little bit. There was a man that had palsy. Jesus healed him from the palsy. There was a large group of people around there that saw him perform this miracle. And they had obviously heard him speak. You know, he did, I'm sure he just didn't walk up and go, he's healed and walk off. I'm sure he had some, some grand something to say. And you can read the passage for yourself. It's in Matthew chapter 9. So I'm going to set that up. And this is what happened after he healed the man of the palsy. came to pass as Jesus sat down at meat in the house. It's Matthew 9, chapter 10. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now notice that they weren't invited. <laughs> Were they? <laughs> I'm sure the homeowner went, Oh, that's a lot of sandwiches. That's a lot of turkey and beans and stuff i got to provide. But the point was, they followed Jesus. They came to where He was. They didn't wait for Him to go, you know what, I'll be back in a little bit, I'm going to go eat, and then I'll come back and then we'll do what we got to do. They followed Him. Many, it says, many publicans and sinners. Many. Why do you think they followed Him? They're looking for something. They saw Him change a man's life, so maybe they thought, He could do that for me. You know, if he could do that for him, he could do that for me. Isn't that why we come in the first place? We come to church because we want our lives to change for the better. So this really is just long-term rehab for bad people, really, if you think about it. It is for me. I'm in a long-term rehab at church. I can't just come once or twice and I'm good. Here we go. Live the rest of my life. I have to have prolonged, long-term exposure to God for me to be better. I can't just come in here, get a quick fix, a pill, and a surgery, and I'm done. It's for me, it's rehab. And I'll be here the rest of my life in rehab. I have to. Because if not, I'm going to go right back to what I was doing prior to that. Amen? So I need this. I need something in in me in rehab. And what goes on, it says, is in verse 11. It's interesting. It's what a religious people respond. It's how they look at it. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? What's he doing hanging out with those kinds of people? 
What do you mean you got drug addicts coming in here? What do you mean you got gays and lesbians coming in here? What do you mean you got people that don't wear suits and ties coming in here? Look at that preacher. He's got on blue jeans. That's the religious response. Man, they play that rock and roll music in there. What is Jesus doing in there? Because He came for a reason. He came after a specific group of people. And He tells a story. Verse 12, When Jesus heard that, He said to them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now, that's interesting. <laughs> Go ye and learn what that means, or meaneth. I will have mercy, not sacrifice. For I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, he throws, right, I mean, you can't get much straighter into the heart of the religious system than what he just said. I would have mercy. I will have mercy on people. That means more to me than any sacrifice that you as a religious person are willing to make. It means more to me to have mercy on somebody. Somebody that comes in and says, you know what? My life is a shambles. I had the palsy just like this man. Can you do for me what you did for him, Jesus? I give my life and everything I am right here to you. Change it, please. And then the religious system says, what's he doing hanging out with those kinds of people? He says, I'd rather have mercy on them than to have a religious system more interested in what they have to sacrifice than focusing directly on me. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Sometimes we've got to give some things up as religious people to really find the true Jesus. He says, go and, and go and uh, when you learn what that means, then you can come back and talk to me about it a little bit. Okay? So they followed Jesus to the house. What were they looking for? They wanted their life to change. So you want your life to change, right? Then why don't you come to church? It's that simple. Okay? Notice Jesus compares the people that He came to minister to as sick people. He says, think of it this way, folks. You got sick folks, they need doctors, right? Okay? People that aren't sick, they don't need doctors. If you're not sick, everything's fine with you, right? So you don't need a doctor. But if you're sick, you need a doctor. Well, what do we call Jesus? The great, help me out, physician. He's called the great physician. That's, those are, these are all terms that are used for, for Jesus. Why? Because He came to heal the brokenhearted, mend the sick. Amen? All the, everything encompassed in His ministry is everything you need to change your life. That's what He came for. So why, why did we first start coming to church? Well, some of us needed emergency room. <laughs> when it's, if you look at it as a hospital, right? We need an emergency room. But we did. I needed to go to the ER. I mean, I was bleeding bad. I was hurting bad. My wife was hurting. My kids were hurting. We needed to go to the emergency room. So we picked up the phone and we called the first person we could think of who was a preacher. And we said, please, you've got to come to the house. Came up. I gave my life to Christ right in the living room. And I had emergency room care right there. The ER, boom. Jesus came, showed up. God showed up. Boom. Changed my life. Changed our family's life. Boom. That's it, right? Wrong. <laughs> Required a follow-up visit. He didn't just say, okay, everything's fixed. There you go. Required a follow-up visit. Sunday morning we got up, got on the best clothes I had, because you know, all I could do at the time, and we went to church. Why? Because that's where Jesus was. I had to go find where Jesus was. I had to follow Him into the house and say, Hey, my life needs changing. Amen? I've surrendered, now I've changed my life. And it's a process. It's not something that's going to happen instantly. It's a process. An ongoing process. If you come thinking that he's just going to go poof and that's it and everything's fine until you die, wrong way to think. Okay? We've got to change the way you think. So they needed emergency room care. Mark chapter 2 verse 3 says this. I always thought this was a great passage. They came unto Jesus, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four which means he had three other brothers, right? or sisters, or whatever, three other siblings. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, couldn't get in there because there's so many people there, they uncovered the roof <laughs> where he was and broke it open and lowered the man down. They let down the bed where in the sick of the palsy lay. Now, you know you really got an emergency going on when you rip the roof off the place to get somebody down in there to where Jesus is, right? Now, this man, his life changed so badly that he couldn't wait. He wasn't going to wait on Jesus. 
He was going to tear the roof open if he had to, to get in there to where he was. Have you ever been that way in your life when you really needed changing so bad that you would go to great lengths to get where, to get where Jesus is, to get where God is? Well, then why don't you come to church? It makes no sense. If you don't. So some of us needed emergency care. We needed an emergency responder. But what do we do when he responds to us? Right? Now think, let's think about this. Okay, you get cut real bad. And you need to go get sewed up, right? Where are you going to go? Help me out here. This is interactive. Go go to the hospital, right? Okay. Say you have a bad car wreck and you hurt real bad. They call an ambulance. The ambulance shows up. They respond. And they put you in the ambulance. And they start up the road and you start going, Hey, 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 wait, wait. Don't go to the hospital. Let's go this way. Well, what kind of sense would that make? Is that how we approach church? Right? We start finding the alternate route to get where we need to go. You see, i got news for you. You're not going to find your life out there in the world. Sunday morning when you get up, if you don't come to church and you're thinking you're going to find life just by going out and hanging out with the same old people you hung out with and doing the same old things that you did years and years ago, expecting your life to change, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. And one treatment at the ER is not going to do it. It's going to require a follow-up visit. You break your leg, how long are you in a cast? What does that cast really do? It allows your leg to heal, but doesn't it restrict you from doing things you did before you broke your leg? Well, amen. Don't we need some emergency care from God? Some long-term, let's don't go back to do the same stuff we did recklessly before we broke our leg. That's what church is for. So, why don't we come to church? Some of us need cardiac care. You ever had a heart attack? Oh, Doug's talked about having one. He can tell you what it physically you know, what it was like, and I'm sure several others could, but have a heart attack. Some of us have had spiritual heart attacks. Amen? Your heart gets broke or messed up. Okay? And where our heart's so broken and we're so down and we're so bad and we need to come to God and we need to come in to the, to the hospital here, the church, and we need God to, to bypass. We need a heart bypass. That's what we need. Right? Do you need a heart bypass from God or do you need God to give you a new heart? Or do you need Him to mend your heart? Let's look at uh, John chapter 20 and see what it says. No, I'm sorry, that's not right. Got to go back and get my other page. It is John 14. Verse 27 says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, not out there, give unto you, let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. And if you read that passage, believe in God, believe you in me. Amen? Believe in me, believe you also in God. It's universal. So don't let your heart be troubled. Where do you find heart mend? Where can you mend your heart? Jesus came to mend the broken heart. He didn't come to bypass. See, the problem is we don't come in looking for a heart to be mended. We come in looking for a bypass. We want to bypass preaching. We want to bypass praise and worship. We want to bypass coming to church. We want to bypass fellowship with each other. We want to bypass all that stuff, and yet we still expect God to mend our broken heart, right? So we're not looking for Him to mend our broken heart. We're looking for a bypass, and He wants to mend your broken heart. Amen? So here's the place to let Him do it. So when you come in, expect long-term cardiac care. It's not a place for you to come in and bypass the troubles of life, and then all of a sudden your life's going to change. You've got to present yourself on a regular basis. And let him mend your broken heart's process. I know this one speaks for me. Some of us need psychiatric care. We need a psych ward for a while. Because our thinking just ain't right. Amen? Uh, I'll tell you how bad I was. I'm going to tell myself. And some of you probably go, God, please have mercy. <laughs> I actually stood in my kitchen one day and told my wife, I am my own God. I don't need God. I did. Because she was on me. You need to go to church. You need to go to church. Boy, if you go to church, we just do this and do this and do that and do this. I looked at her and I said, Honey, I am my own God. Because I thought I was so smart, see. I could just figure out a way to fix everything. And boy, that got me nowhere. 
And it's a wonder a lightning bolt didn't come through the roof right there. Poof! Big puff of smoke right there. But I did. And what I really needed was some psychiatric care from God. I needed Him to fix some thinking in my life. I needed some, some thinking straightened out in my life. Amen? So what I really needed is the mind of Christ. Because what happens when I start coming to church, and on a regular basis, He begins to renew my mind. My mind begins to be renewed. The Bible actually says, with the Word of God, your mind can be completely renewed. Wouldn't you like to have a new mind? And we were talking about it before church, about how we forget things now. Now that we get older, we start forgetting things. Right? Wouldn't you like to have your mind renewed? Remember the things of God if you remember nothing else in life. So what was the reason you first came to church? Psychiatric care? Uh, some of us needed respiratory care. We needed our breathing fixed. Right? We needed God to come in and we were smothered. And we needed a fresh breath from God to come in. Right? The Spirit of God to move in our lives. The Spirit comes in, gives you resuscitation, and you're up and you're running, and then you quit coming to church. And guess what happens? Right back in the same old mess you were in before you started going. Right back smothered again. Breath of God gone. And you come back, God, please... Breathe into my life again. You see, I kind of looked at it this way. Maybe we've, we've lost our first love. We've gotten away from our first love of church. You know, why did, why did you first come and, that, and you loved it? Because everything got fixed. And that was your first love about church. And then something happens and you're like, I, I'm not going anymore. I just don't feel like going today. Or, or, you know, it's just not doing the same thing for me back then as it did now. So I'm not going to go. So what's first? What's, why did you first start coming? What was your first love? Um, let me ask this. Has God taken care of that first reason that you came? You know, if you came because your family was a disaster, is your family better? If not, then why don't you come to church? Came for healing, are you healed? Came for a better marriage, is a marriage better? I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? If your marriage is not any better and you came for a better marriage, it doesn't mean you need to quit coming. It just means you need to come more. Amen? Good opportunity coming up here Friday. Right? Come in there and maybe learn some things. And Kurt Cameron, by the way, is a preacher. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. The actor that's in that, the lead actor. He and his wife have a huge ministry. And so he has enough money now to produce these kinds of movies. Amen? And I bet you won't hear a lot of cussing in that movie like you do the rest of them either. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. So did you come for an emergency? Is everything all right now? Is your heart doing okay with God? If it's not, if you're still having heart problems, you probably need to come back for a follow-up visit. Amen? Is your breathing okay? You're still smothered by the things in life? Come back for a follow-up visit. Right? Routine visit, as they say. Have you left your first love? Ask yourself this. Have I left my first love? If so then Jesus sent us a prophetic word through the book of Revelation. It says this, Revelation chapter 2, To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which is really the churches, if you study that out. I know thy works, labor, patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. You, can't, you, you hast tried them which say they're apostles, and they're not. And found them to be liars, born and have patience, and for my name's sake, you've labored and has not fainted. Man, you've done a great job. Your church is, is rocking and rolling in the candlesticks, and you got all this stuff going on. You got you're a church among churches, except this one thing. There's just one little thing here. Like Lance preaches, there's one thing. Nevertheless, I have someone against you because thou hast left thy first love. So what's your first love? What was the first reason you came to church? You, are you thankful to God for that if He did meet your need? If so, then why don't you come to church? Amen? It's the very least we can do to show our gratitude for what God does for us. Remember, therefore, from whence you've fallen and repent and do your first works or else I will come quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. What he's saying is, I'll come and I'll take the church away from you. Is that what we want? You know, we leave that first love with God. We stop doing the first things that God wants us to do. Okay, now let's lighten up a little bit. That's been kind of heavy. I don't like to leave you heavy. Um, notice it says in there... Um, 
to repent. Okay? A little bit of teaching here. I think the church has done a disservice to the word repent. If I were to ask you what the word repent, or what does it mean to repent, what would you tell me? Okay? Yeah, there's some Bible teaching going on over here, see? Most of the time when you ask people what repent means, they'll tell you, well, I have to feel sorry for all the bad things I did, all the sin. Right? And a lot of times I'll see these little tracks. You, you might see them laying around in, in, in parking lots. Or I had one on my window, I think, when I left work yesterday. It said something about repent from your sins and then turn to God, which is okay. Then, you know, that's a good way to approach it. But is that the proper use of how you repent? See, repent really doesn't have anything to do with apologizing for all the bad things you did. Repent means to change the way that you think, especially about the things of God. Okay? How do I know that? Well, first of all, I've looked the definition of the word up. That's probably a good idea. If you don't know what a word means, get a dictionary. It's probably a good idea. Look it up. We play this, that game at our house. How do you spell this? What does this mean? I don't know. Look it up. Okay? So, what if I told you that God actually repented? Now, has God sinned? Okay? But he, yet He has repented. Right? So, if God repented... And he has never sinned, then obviously the word repent doesn't mean to apologize for your sins, right? So if I could show you that, it would make it true, right? Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6. Put that up there. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Exodus 32 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Judges 2.18, And when the Lord raised them up judges, and the Lord was with the judge, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days uh, of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that opposed them and vexed them. So God repented. All it means, very simply, is to change the way that you think. To clean up your stinking thinking. Right? And I say those phrases because you'll remember that phrase, I promise you, for the next six months, you'll go, clean up my stinking thinking. Right? I love it. The kids will come up, you know, after I finish, and they'll go, man, I just love that. And it's amazing that the kids remember it six months down the road. You just clean up your stinking thinking. And it's that simple. So we, we complicate things in church. We make it more complicated than it really is. All you got to do is get up, put on some clothes, and come to church. That simple. Right? And yet, we don't do it. So why don't we do it? Why don't we come to church? Because it's the place where God set and sanctified in our area, in our community, to come and, and, and uh, worship Him. And you find where Solomon built a temple, and God speaks to him and says that he chose to place himself in that house of sacrifice. God says, this is the house where I'm going to place myself for you to come and sacrifice. And that's the old covenant. The new covenant says, bring your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is where you come for your sacrifice, by presenting yourself at His altar. And then He changes your life. Amen? And then we get this promise. We hear this one all the time. And I, what I thought was interesting about this one was set in Second Chronicles seven twelve through 16. It says that uh, Solomon had built a temple and the Lord appeared to him by night. He chose there. And then let's look at verse 14. And he says, Your house is here. You built it. This is my house. Now this is the place I'm going to come. And he says this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. What is that a long definition of? The word repent. He just spelled it all out, but he said it that way. He says, Then... Will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal, heal their land? Now my eyes shall be opened, my ears attend unto the prayer that is made where? In this place. So if you know for sure, you're at home. He's not hearing my prayers. I know one place He will. For absolutely sure, He promised it. If you think if you're at home, you, oh, He's not hearing my prayers. Come to church. He says, I'll hear the prayer there. Because that's the place where you come to sacrifice. For now I have chosen and sanctified 
this house, verse 16 says, that my name may be there forever. And mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually, continually, all the time. I know without a doubt there is a place that I can go when I'm in doubt that God shows up, I know one place I can go where He'll be. Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, I guarantee you He'll be here. Wherever two or more are gathered in His name, there am I in the midst also. I for absolutely am sure He'll be here then. So why in the world would I not come to church? Makes no sense. Are we not a chosen people? This place not sanctified for the service of the work of God? Are we not instructed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice? Then why don't we come to church? Makes no sense. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to come to church. Lord, we thank You for the opportunity to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to You. We ask, Lord, now that You put a desire and a drive into not only us, Lord, but all the people of God across the United States, across the world, every nation, Lord, where You have placed Your house uh, sanctified and set it aside. We ask that there be a mass gathering, Lord of people to your house, that we all come together in the power of praise and the power of worship and the power of prayer, that we know for sure you're there in the midst. Father, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to minister to those who can't come because of the physical illnesses. We thank you, Lord, that you're already working miracles in their lives, Lord. And if not, we just thank you that you will be receiving them, Lord. Amen. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Got a prophetic word. I didn't give it last week because I thought this was the perfect week to do it. And, uh, you know, with the election, the way that it went, it didn't go the way a lot of folks thought it was going to go. But, you know, God is still in control. Amen. And uh, notice uh, it was a hope was kind of the theme for what's going on. And I I admit I was kind of concerned about the way that we were going. And so I began to pray and I began to seek God on it going, you know, and I watched my 401k go. And then. And then all of that kind of stuff, if you, if you invest, you know what I'm talking about. You see your plans kind of going this way. And then I realized my security and safety is not in that. It's in God. And what God spoke to me was to make sure to tell everybody, no, that it's all right. It's going to be okay. And what He told me was, this year would be a better year than any year we have ever seen in our lives. And that's what He said to me. He said, you'll have a better year this year than you've had in your entire life. This will be the better year for the whole world. Because what He's going to do is expose some things to all the nations where they will understand Him in a better way than they ever have before. Even the nations, and especially those nations who don't follow Him, that follow after idols and follow after false God and follow after false religions. You see, He hasn't forgotten who they are. He still loves them. And so He's going to use this opportunity to reveal Himself to our nation and to the world. Amen? And that's the word, prophetic word He spoke to me. So if I can leave you with this, don't worry. Everything is going to be alright. Amen?